Now, for today, uh, we have the pleasure of having my friend, Sergey Kellen, and speak to us. Um, we thought that it would be great to have a series of these webinars in advance of the hackathon to sort of get people's ideas rolling about what are the sort of applications that they could see. And, you know, I thought this was a good one because it brings together characterization, it brings together active learning, it brings together microscopy and machine learning. Like these things are, I think, an interesting mix. And Sergey is a great speaker and a, I think a provocative and interesting thinker in this space as well. So, uh, Sergey, I'm not going to use up more of your time, but we are uh, very happy to have you here. I'm going to go ahead and turn over screen share. And we'd love to have you um, go ahead and tell us about your talk, which is entitled Microscopy is All You Need. Thank you, Taylor. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, actually, the first time when I present the talk with this title, so I'm curious about what the, uh, what your thoughts about it will be. So uh, this work uh, is largely b based on uh, effort that I've done uh, when I uh, at Oak Ridge with uh, several of my colleagues at Oak Ridge at, at uh, UT Knoxville. And this is exactly the work that I will continue as a uh, faculty at UT. So as uh, a necessary intermission, I had somewhat unusual part, uh, research path. So I've been in Oak Ridge for 20 years. Then I decided as many uh, scientists before me that at some point transition to academia at this part way is a good idea. But then I decided that, look, I've been working on machine learning in the experimental physical science, sciences for 15 years. May be exceptionally useful to get some industry perspective on uh, this. So for this year, I am a principal research scientist at Amazon. So kind of going from lab to industry to academia. So uh, as you can guess from the title of this talk, so uh, microscopy is all you need follows the uh, line of argument that started with the paper by Ashish Vaswani uh, five years ago in which he reported the development of the attention and transformers. So this is probably one of the most famous papers in the uh, machine learning community. So it got 50,000 citations over five years. Uh, obviously it got it because of the concept it introduced rather than because of the title. But the title become a little bit of a meme. So if you look at archive, the number of papers that have is all you need in their title by now is something like 50. So I decided that if we try to connect the machine learning and the microscopy, maybe we can follow the pathway that has been proven to be useful in the machine learning community. So let me illustrate a little bit uh, why uh, we care about the machine learning in microscopy. And, uh, entirely obvious that for the last 10 years, uh, this has been a field that has been growing exponentially from computer vision to medicine to autonomous systems. So probably uh, half of at least my Twitter news is all about the automated cars and whether Tesla is going to be truly automated driving or not. Uh, the development of the machine learning network and architectures has been absolutely amazing. So the uh, deep learning image that appeared exactly 10 years ago, and then basically every month there would be a new development such as PCNNs, out encoders, transformers at attention, graph network, and of course the techniques or the tools that people can use evolve. So Google Colabs appeared barely four years ago, and now it's possible to imagine uh, the world where the Google Colabs don't exist. And I'm pretty sure that in the next few years the cloud computing, something like Amazon Cloud or Google Cloud, will become equally important for individual researchers, small research. But the interesting thing is that the progress and impact for experimental physical science have relatively speaking been uh, relatively small. So there is notable group in this field. Uh, many of us uh, are familiar with this work and the people involved. But if you compare it is to the state of the art in machine in uh, material science or condensed matter physics, this is not simply a minority, that's a very small minority. If you compare it to the amount of effort in the proper computer sciences, then of course it's just uh, delta X. But the question is, why is it different? And uh, after doing it for quite a while, uh, I thought that it is, makes sense to elucidate several primary facts. So the first one is that if we want to do machine learning in the domain area, First and foremost, requires domain expertise and domain-specific goals. 
when we make an automated car, the goal is implicitly understood. We want to get from point A to point B in the least possible time and not get in a crash. That's a very well-defined goal. If we run a physical experiment, we don't necessarily know what the goal is. I mean, we have some idea or some hypothesis, but it's very difficult to explain what this goal is to the machine learning algorithm. Another factor is that the physical sciences are usually causal and hypothesis driven. Machine learning by far and large is, the, is correlated and there is big difference. So correlation is not causation, uh, it comes across loud and clear. And then, you know, machine learning is not a single method that you can learn and apply. It's essentially a culture. Uh, and it's a culture based on infrastructure, open code, open data, and the hackathon that Taylor and team organizes is an example of how this culture that was originally fostered in computer science community start to uh, enter materials and physics. But most important is that a uh, scientific process is an active learning. We are not given a static data set that we try to understand. Scientific process is the process of me as an investigator, having the tools which are extension of my capabilities, interacting with the unknown universe and trying to learn how it is built and operate. That's actually exceptionally diff different from machine learning when you're given a data set or maybe data set on labels and you try to understand how it is built. So, and then uh, for quite a while, sort of talking with uh, folks like Rama, uh, Maxim and uh, the Oakridge team, we came to, to this somewhat flippant, but after a while it turned out that maybe it is less flippant than we think, idea why microscopy is all you need from machine learning perspective. In other words, why would a bona fide microscopist, or sorry, bona fide machine learning person actually try to pick up microscopy as the area of domain to put the effort in? And uh, I think he sort of, that may be a not immediately obvious statement, but let me illustrate a little bit the logic and the timeline of the development of the machine learning community which logic in some sense uh, explains why I'm now in Amazon. So before year 2000, the whole uh, community was about IT. So it was uh, the time when internet was emerging. So the idea was to build an internet connection between maximum number of nodes. And uh, the first way of the businesses such as dot coms, Amazon and so on, were basically built using the existing IT infrastructure as the basis. But at that time, Amazon did not use uh, this infrastructure in order to any, do any analysis. It was using it just to collect the request from the customers and let them know that the uh, order is being mailed out. So the year, year 2000, 2010 was roughly the time when it was all about collecting and searching the data. So this is when Facebook and Google grew. This is when Uber appeared because Uber obviously tells you, uh, connects you to the driver. So it was about the date. The time period from 2010 to 2020 was roughly about what do we learn. So imagine that Google has access to virtually all text of the internet, or Facebook knows everything about cat uh, and uh, social networks. What can we learn from it? And of course, for companies, it's also how can we monitor it. But uh, I, sometimes I wonder whether the opportunities of growing in the pure data direction by now are almost exhausted. So for example, Google has access to all the text on the internet. I'm not sure that there is much more of the new text being generated. Uh, same thing applies to the cat on the Facebook. So there are a lot of uh, cats uh, there, but I'm not sure that addition of uh, more images is going to tell us something new. So the question is, where can the whole IT field move from this moment on. And the argument that I and my colleagues make that the new data would be actually studying physics. So uh, adding the correlation, sorry, adding the causation, adding the prior knowledge, imposing the physical constraints. And if you want to know more, you're welcome to read this opinion piece of the article. So the question is, why microscopy? The answer is that uh, real world problems uh, that are associated with the largest distribution shift, small data sets, presence of controllable factors. 
For example, we cannot really use machine learning to analyze the system, which is the, has the large uh, input of the random noise. So that would limit our predictive uh, capability. We also know that real world problems are very often active learning. So we need to interrogate the data generation process and provide the feedback that will tell it where to go. We are not necessarily dealing with the static data. Uh, of course, there are computations. Very often we have prior knowledge of past data, physical laws, and so on and so forth. But still, imagine that I want to understand what happens in the chemical space of small molecules or material. It's a very, very large space. It is the space that have, uh, uh, it's simply difficult to uh, analyze it, no matter the uh, machine learning methods. It's nobody tells us that it's differentiable in the first place. But uh, so building the physical system, for example, automated lab for discovering new chemistry and new physics can be difficult because the space is not tractable. But microscopy, on the one hand, allows us to work with much smaller and low dimensional spaces. But at the same time, it's an ideal playground with the active learning. We still can find a surprise. So therefore, uh, my argument is that uh, if we want to build active learning methods, microscopy is in some sense an ideal soft toy model. Think about it as a MNIST model for the large, for the big data. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you an example of the type of problem that we can so uh, let's assume that I'm a microscopist and uh, I get this image of the ferrolactic domain pattern inside the material. And let's assume that I want to study the selected region using some complex spectroscopy. So this is something that we've been working on at NORANL for 15 years. And uh, sometimes we get to the point of uh, having 100 gigabyte data set about uh, five years ago, at which point we stopped scaling the volumes of data, start to think about the machine learning to acquire the data more effectively. So that's exactly the reason. So how would I do that? And the answer is that if I have this image and I need to play the point of pick game, I can select this region, for example, or based on my domain expertise, I know that I don't expect anything interesting here, but being a hopefully good experimentalist, I still want to collect my baseline of microscope performance. Then I would measure the behaviors of material in this and this region. And uh, if I give the results which are consistent, then there would be no need for me to explore this region or this region because it is exactly the same. And after that, I can kind of explore this region because it looks cool or this region and uh, sort of use them to refine my knowledge about it. Notice a very interesting thing that this logic applies to absolutely other any field. So exactly the same logic applies to any kind of other microscopy, for example, electron microscopy or optical microscopy and non-indentation. With a little bit of imagination, exactly the same logic applies for chemical synthesis. Because for example, when I uh, buy a robot that performs the automated synthesis of the hybrid perovskite, in some sense, what I want to do is I want to synthesize the material in the automated fashion. And then uh, after measuring their properties, I want to navigate my pathway within the phase diagram. So in some sense, uh, the chemical space of the hybrid perovskite, so in this case, this is just a, uh, this is just a uh, phase diagram. And the image space of the microscope is the example of the search in a relatively low dimensional, more or less differentiable space. So more or less means that there is a finite number of the continuity. Compared to that, if we want to uh, explore the physical model, for example, the phase space of the Ising model, it's exactly the same problem. So we have a low dimensional differentiable space. If we want to explore the chemical space of the small organic molecules, that's a different problem. That's a very high dimensional space. And uh, maybe we are lucky enough to find the low dimensional differentiable representation, but more often than that, not. So that's, that's a separate story. What's interesting is that, uh, the, uh, for, interesting for me personally, and hopefully useful in general, is that the microscopy and the chemistry kind of come hand in hand when you talk about the combinatorial library. So it's relatively easy to deposit the combinatorial library, which is essentially the slice across the phase diagram. So this is the example of the one-dimensional one. Uh, they can be made up to three and four-dimensional. 
they're easy to make. People know how to do it for at least 20, 25 years. But if you choose the locations for detailed studies, for example, using the electron microscopy, uh, you need to be very careful about how you select the points because you have a very expensive experiment. So we need exactly the same type of extra learning. And as uh, Taylor mentioned, uh, uh, Tokridge, we worked with for quite a while. So we started to work on the neural network and the theory experiment matching from the time when it was not a big thing. And this is the line of research that we have been pursuing ever, ever since. So second thing that I need to uh, mention explicitly is that if we want to do the active experiment or automated experiment, uh, machine learning can help, but it's not necessary. So one of the biggest things that I realized when I worked with the uh, automated experiments in either synthesis or microscopy is that uh, we can do a lot of things using the primitive technique. For example, about three years ago um, in the method of piezo response force microscopy, we have come up with a concept called Ferrobot, which is basically the idea that you scan your surface and whenever your tip uh, crosses the domain wall, uh, it applies the bias plot. So this is a very useful experiment because it allows you to separate the process of the, uh, of the domain nucleation and domain wall motion. That's one of the fundamental issues in the physics of ferroelectric. The catch is that it doesn't require anything other than essentially lock and amplifier in the relay, which means that technically it could have been done 25 years. The interesting thing is that despite the fact that ferroelectric community really loves this technique, and there are tens of groups active in this year, and despite the fact that I personally worked in this field for 25 years, uh, it didn't come to anyone's mind to do it, uh, do it this way, even though technically it was possible. So inertia of thinking is very important, and I think it affects a lot of fields, uh, including automated experiment synthesis and so on and so forth. Of course, machine learning can help. So for example, we can build an experiment where we use the simple neural network to identify, sorry, simple image analysis to identify points where we do the detailed measurement. Or we can try to use the deep learning to do that. Deep learning is interesting. So. Uh, first time we tried to apply machine learning for electron microscopy was exactly five years ago. So this is our signal coming this time from the electron microscope. This is a hole. This is a graphene. This bright blob uh, silicon atoms. This is what the deep convolutional network can do with this data. So it finds the carbon atoms and finds the silicon atoms. And uh, uh, for about five years, this um, video was a source of inspiration for us because uh, the thought was, look, we can see how the atoms move. Can we really learn the physics of the system out? So can I determine what are the force fields acting in the system of atoms based on the observation of the atomic motion? The second thought was, can I run this in the real time? So I have a data stream coming from the microscope. Can I run this type of analysis while the data is coming from the microscope? Turns out that this is exceptionally difficult. So it took us five years and uh, essentially independently coming up with the concept of the ensemble network and iterative training to learn how to build the uh, plugin which takes the data streaming from the microscope and converts it to atomic positions in the real, uh, real time. So there are reasons for that, which is the uh, primary reason is the out of distribution shift. So your microscope can be tuned uh, differently on different days, and the network trained for one day will not work very well on the second day. It is exactly the same problem as Tesla has, so there is a reason why it is very difficult to train machine vision algorithms for automated cars. Uh, if you change the uh, lighting condition, they start to not work that well. But for microscopy, it's easier, and uh, this was actually one of the observations why we say microscopy is all you need. So if the machine learning community first try to solve the microscopy problem, when we have strong inferential biases, so we know how the atoms look like, and uh, we have a very low risk compared to Tesla, maybe that can be something worth doing. But anyway, that's common sense. That's not always how the science works. On the positive side, once we build the plugin that allow us to convert images to atomic position in real time, we can actually 
uh, do a lot of fancy things. For example, we can take this atomic coordinates, send them to the high performance computers. So they use as the input for the DFT or MD simulation. Or we can take, tell the electron beam to follow certain path and kick some atoms out. So what you see here is the different material, molybdenum sulfide. We just took a take electron beam to target specific sulfur atoms. And uh, you kick out the sulfur atom, and now you see the uh, defect arranged in the letter R. So if you want to ask why letter R, is because the person who did it is Kevin Rocapriori. So R stands for, stands for Rocapriori. Uh, once you learn how to do that, however, for at atomic uh, atomic uh, imaging, it becomes possible to do it for more complex things. So this is the example of the similar architecture of the neural network, which is now trained to decouple the ferroelectric domain. So at the first glance, it seems like, okay, this may be very easy. These features are very uh, visible. It's actually not. Notice that we have these domain walls, which are ferroelastic domain walls, our algorithm have found them very clearly. Notice that we have other domain wall, which goes dark line like this, or dark line here. This is a ferroelectric domain wall. Notice that the algorithm actually did not detect this particular wall. It detects only the ferroelastic wall. And uh, this is achieved through the uh, ensemble technique. So they give you the wall position, the uncertainties. So sometimes if something weird is happening, uh, the algorithm tells you, I'm not particularly certain what happens in these places, and this is something we can use. For example, if our goal was to study the material as well as possible, we will use uncertainty to choose the locations for the study. And of course, once we have uh, automated wall finder, we now can systematically answer all the questions uh, related to the experimental studies of the known domain wall. For example, we can tell our microscope to perform the hysteresis loop measurement only on the wall, and then we can visualize the results, and lo and behold, you start to see something interesting. For example, you can see that one side of the domain wall has very different response than the other side. This is obvious because the domain walls are tilted with respect to the surface normal, so this part clearly has a different physics than this part. But we also can see the variability across the domain wall that we don't quite understand yet, but we know that they are real, so we see that this points form a Blob. This points form a blob, so there are some interesting underpinning mechanisms that we are not aware about, but at least now we can visualize. So this is great, and this is an example of a relatively straightforward automated experiment. I know what I'm looking for, and I just want to identify it in the image using supervised learning, and I want to perform the additional measurement. Question becomes, uh, how do I study things where I don't know what I'm doing? So in this case, uh, we need to forget a little bit about the fact that we're physicists and think for a second about uh, how the uh, how the uh, data scientists think about. It. So as a physicist, I usually consider the world as the collection of uh, facts that I know, as a collection of laws that are in some sense the generalization of this fact and some form of the system that put these laws and facts in a, in a system. If you will, it's kind of a knowledge graph. So whenever I make, an, and this knowledge graph forms my domain expertise, and that knowledge graph makes me a domain expert, or hopefully makes me a domain expert. So when I learn something new, uh, first of all, I try to figure out, is it real or not? How much do I trust it? And secondly, I try to see it how is this new information fits into my prior knowledge? Does it fit the holes in my knowledge? Does it allow me to build new understanding? Does it allow me to extrapolate? So physics is highly structured. If you go to the more classical data disciplines, for example, the Gaussian processes, that's not how, uh, that's not how the world is organized. Let me illustrate it uh, from the logical perspective. So uh, imagine that uh, you have some unknown function, which is just a scalar function over some interval. If you don't know anything whatsoever, this function can be absolutely anything. So it can be essentially a random noise with absolutely unknown distribution. That's not very useful. So the way the data science approach this problem is says, look, I don't know anything, but I assume that my function has only one characteristic. 
which is I know the correlation from one point to another. So this is what the Gaussian process prior is. This uh, uh, essentially introduces some correlation in the system. So if your uh, correlation length is uh, 100, this is how your functions look like. If it is one tenth, this is how they look like. If it is one, this is how they look like. So it's just a measure of correlation. And uh, if you take the experiment, that means that lo and behold, you actually determine the value of the function in several locations. But you still have all the flexibility of the Gaussian process to say that you have not only prediction, but you also have the uncertainty. And uh, this uh, capability of the Gaussian process to create the prediction and uncertainty allows you to run the automated experiment. Because then if you did measurement in several locations, you can choose uh, where to do the measurement. Either you want to do the next measurement in the place where you expect something useful is going to happen, or you can do the next measurement in the location where something useful may happen because the uncertainty is high. So there is an amazing uh, review by Nanda de Freitas about uh, seven years ago that really explains this logic very well, and which sort of introduces the standard uh, uh, ways to balance the perceived benefit and the uncertainty in the form of the acquisition function. So this is uh, Bayesian optimization, it's great. The way we typically use it is uh, we run our experiments, we start with some data, we reconstruct the function and the uncertainty using some policy, how much we want to balance discovery and, uh, and uh, of novel behaviors versus person specific goal. We combine them in the acquisition function and then we choose the next place for running the experiment in the form of acquisition function. So we started to work on the Bayesian optimization in the, uh, about three years ago, and uh, the same argument as with uh, uh, Taylor's description of the hackathon. So we started to work with it. At that time, uh, there was no BioTorch, so Maxim has to build his own uh, uh, library for the GP processes. And uh, then COVID happened. So the question for us was, what are we going to do? So uh, in the summer of 2020, I spent about four months nonstop applying Bayesian optimization for a variety of uh, problems. And we started from the theory problem. So for example, we can explore the uh, phase space of the Ising model. And what you see is how the very greedy uh, Gaussian prediction algorithm tries to find the lines where there is a maximum of the heat capacity. So this is the ground truth. The calculation is done on the grid. Uh, this is the exploration pathway. So this is the points that are discovered by the algorithm. And this is the GP prediction. So as you can see, when we start, uh, it takes some time to find the line of this uh, phase transitions. And then the greedy algorithm just keeps exploring this line until it basically reconstructs the phase diagram. And we thought, great, Bayesian optimization really works wonderful. So how about we take a Bayesian optimization and we put it on top of the real microscope. So we spent quite some time exploring it. Uh, if you run it on the pre-acquired data, uh, it looks sort of convincing. So it felt good. And then the COVID restrictions were relaxed and Rama and Maxim were able to get to the lab. And uh, they went through all the effort of uh, taking the microscope, taking the DJX box, deploying the uh, Maxim's GPIM library on this box and run the automated experiment in microscope. So uh, and this is the example how it looks like. So in this case, we are using the batch update. So this is the experimental data points. This is the GP prediction. This is GP uncertainty. And uh, if you have a feeling that this doesn't look particularly convincing or particularly useful and something not clear if it is useful at all, you will be correct. So you actually have to wait for quite a while before the GP process starts to even show something. And uh, then if you, you went long enough and compare the GP prediction on the microscope and the ground truth, where we do the measurements everywhere, you can see that this is really not anything to write home about. So this is the image that shows very high level the details. There are uh, large features, there are small features, there are interesting hierarchical structures. The GP image shows that the collection 
So the question is, why is it happening? And the answer is because, the, as I said, microscopy is all you need. So the microscopy image illustrates some of the problems that you can have in the real space. So in many cases, our parameter space is not differentiable. So there is a very sharp transition from this region to this region. Uh, we also have the details on multiple lengths. So remember that Gaussian process tries to build the kernel function. And kernel is basically a discovered um, correlation function. So if we try to represent this image by the correlation function, we are not going to get particularly far. Exactly the same problem exists if we try to use the Gaussian process to explore the synthesis of hybrid perovskite. If there is a rapid change in properties at the phase transition line, Gaussian process is not going to work very well. And these are low dimensional space. If you try to apply the Gaussian process in the chemical space of the system, where one group of compounds have a very different properties from another group of compounds, there would be surprises because the basic GPs are not very good in uh, dealing with this type of problem. So the question becomes, what can you do about it? And then we realize that, uh, you know, we almost, at least in the experiment, so now I'm talking about something that is microscopy centric. So this type of concept can be applied for automated synthesis, but uh, that becomes less straightforward. So when we run the microscopy experiment, we never choose, we never treat our system as a black box. In fact, what we do is we take our image and then we try to choose the location for experiment based on the local structure. So GP doesn't do that. We need to have an algorithm that somehow tells us that based on the observation of the local domain structure, for example, the image patch, we need to choose the location for spectroscopic measurement. And it turns out that we can do it using the method called the deep kernel learning. So basically, this is a hybrid of the deep convolutional network and the Gaussian process. You use the DCNN in order to take your image and compress it to the small number of Latin variables. And then you run the GP on top of this Latin variable space. So the way it works is that we take our image, we split it in the collection of patches, so they're all known. Uh, we measure a spectrum in one location, and then we train the network using all the patches and only one spectrum. So unsurprisingly, if we do that, then the network will predict the same spectrum for all the different patches, but it will predict it with a different uncertainty. For patches which are exactly like this one, prediction would be reliable, and for patches which are different, prediction will not be reliable. So what we do after that is we choose the region with the maximum uncertainty, and then we take the uh, hysteresis loop measurement there. And then we retrain our network. So now it can find the uh, kind of two uh, pairs of the domain and the loop reliably, and everything else comes with uncertainty. And then you repeat this process so it becomes a active learning. What's also interesting is that once the system is more or less trained, we can also add the uh, physical discovery, which tells us uh, when we tell the system what are the interesting uh, histories of loop. So this is how it experimentally look like. So what you see, the uh, Jupyter notebook that actually interacts with the microscope and tells the microscope where to take the images. So this is the active learning process. And this is the end result. So this is the domain structure. The dots here is the measurements, the location that microscope has chosen to perform the measurement. And basically, we told the microscope to find the regions where the area under the hysteresis loop is maximum. You can see that for the on-field measurement, these locations are all concentrated around the 180 degree domain wall. And for the off-field measurement, these locations are concentrated on only one side of the ferroelastic domain. So this is interesting because essentially we told our microscope to find the regions that has the highest mobility of the ferroelastic domain. And uh, it was able to do exactly that in the fully unsupervised automatic manner. And uh, of course, in this case, uh, we can check the answers, so they make a physical sense. But you can easily imagine that the same type of experiment can be run for different targets. So this is another example when we convince the electron microscope to do exactly the same thing. 
except that in this case, we are trying to analyze the electron energy loss spectrum. So this is a material, manganese PS3, which is one of the layer to the material. So this is just flake. Uh, these materials have a bulk plasmon. They have an edge plasmon. So we tell our algorithm to find the location where the ratio of low energy peak is to the high energy peak is higher. And as you can see, uh, if the microscope operates, eventually it starts to map the regions which are positioned on the edge of the plate. So here, our physical discovery criterion is very, very general. So we don't prescribe the position of the peak. We don't prescribe the shape of the peak. We just say, given the spectrum, find two peaks and use the ratio of this one to this one as the uh, measure of interest. And the microscope has actually done that. And we can try it at different flakes, and you can see that it works. So sometimes it discovers this edge. Sometimes it's really not sure whether to where to lock in on interesting behavior, but overall it works. So in some sense, we can say that a very important statement here is that the discovery pathway, the sequence at which microscope will take the measurement, is really dependent on the reward structure. So we need to tell the microscope uh, what is that that we are looking for. When you run any kind of automated experiment in the chemical spaces for materials discovery, the reward becomes even more important. So the experiment will take totally different direction depending on what to tell uh, the system to explore. So that was interesting. But then we realized that uh, in the deep kernel learning, we actually try to take into example the prior data about the system, but we actually don't take into account any knowledge of the physics. And the whole issue of uh, combining physics and machine learning is obviously very complicated. There are multiple ways of doing it. So since we build everything based on the GP, we realize that in GP, uh, if you take a classical Gaussian process or Bayesian presentation textbook, you will typically have an introduction. And then you will have a very, the biggest part of the discussion would be focused on how do you structure your kernel. At the same time, any random process doesn't have only the correlation, it also has the mean function. And uh, typically, the textbook will tell you that the mean function of the Gaussian process is a domain specific problem. And therefore, it is relatively unexplored. So it turns out that if you are running active experiments where you want to discover physics, the mean function is actually exactly how you introduce your physical knowledge in the system. So the mathematics here is uh, obviously not something that can be explained in the uh, our presentation or probably even in the several hours long presentation. But basically what it means is that instead of the uh, prior predictive distribution that look like this, where we know only the correlation, we can took the prior predictive distributions which have some specific shape. For example, we can make a probabilistic model where which basically says that our functions have only two peaks and we know the priors on this peak position distribution, and then we use this probabilistic model as the mean function for the Gaussian process. So this is kind of the result. Notice that this does wonders if we want to apply it for a physical problem. So imagine that I have a situation like this. So in my case, it was simulated by uh, exploring the hybrid perovskite, but you can come up with a multiple other examples. So imagine that your ground truth looks like this black line. So or your uh, predicted GP reconstruction looks like the red line. Uh, the blue dot is the sample point. So imagine that we want to use our active experiment in order to discover this black function using the classical GP process. So this is the reconstruction, this is the acquisition function. You can see that it finds the initial values reasonably well, but there is no way in the world it can discover this rapid jump simply because. In order to discover this jump, you need to make your kernel length very short, which means that you need to sample the remainder of the parameter space very densely. So this is just an intrinsic uh, give or take that you cannot get around classical GP. Imagine now that you have a structured GP where your mean functions have only one jump. So it turns out that in this case, the process works exceptionally well. So if you start to run the GP, the algorithm finds the position of the jump very rapidly. 
it spends a very small uh, allocation of the experimental budget to pinpoint where it is exactly. And then it is very effectively reconstructing the rest of the function. So knowing physics really accelerates the uh, automated experiment. You can argue, can it work for the two-dimensional, more complex case? Of course it can. So this is the example of the Ising model. So this is magnetization, ferromagnetic phase, and the ferromagnetic phase, frustrated phases. So if I try, to, uh, this is the ground truth. If I try to run the classical GP, this is the reconstruction is not very impressive. And you can see that the GP have sampled all parts of the phase diagram uh, equally. So you see that where the location point. If I introduce the probabilistic model that basically says that there is only one region with the known magnetiz with the high magnetization, there are other regions with the zero magnetization. These regions are separated by the sharp boundary, and the profile of magnetization across this boundary is roughly tangent h. Then the algorithm finds it much faster. Notice that in this case, this is my reconstruction. It looks almost like a ground truth. And my experimental points are rigidly localized on the ferromagnetic, not ferromagnetic boundary. There is a caveat. For example, we have paramagnetic phases here, and they are not discovered. They are not discovered because there was not a part of our probabilistic model. So the question is, why is it useful? The answer is it is useful because in physics, we very often know this type of information from the uh, some sort of asymptotic argument. For example, for the Ising model, the exact solution came out of uh, Ising. But before Ising, a lot of people like Onsager and Lenz, basically, sorry, by the Onsager, but a lot of people have come up with the solutions for the high, uh, uh, high temperature and low temperature asymptote. So we typically have this physical knowledge, and all we have to do is to make it a part of the Gaussian process, but now it's doable. You can argue that, uh, okay, it's not always the case that we have a single physical model. Sometimes we have uh, uh, multiple models as an alternative hypothesis. So what can we do about it? And it turns out that uh, this approach can be a uh, structured Gaussian model can be extended into what we call the hypothesis active learning. So this is a relatively new concept. So let me illustrate how it works. So imagine that you have a physical measurement system. It can be chemical synthesis, it can be film growth, it can be microscopy, it can be electrical measurement. Uh, the only thing about the system is that it gives you the experimental results one by one, and it has a reasonably well-defined parameter space. So we take a measurement, we send the result of this measurement for the uh, structured Gaussian process, and we also inform this structured Gaussian process by the list of hypotheses meaning model one with one probability, model two with the second probability, and so on. Uh, there can be a null hypothesis, which is just a pure Gaussian process, but usually it's better to have them physics-based. And then what we do is that based on the result of experiment and the list of hypotheses, we do two things. We update the probabilities of the model and model parameters, and we choose the next measure location for the next measurement that will guarantee to minimize the uncertainty of our hypothesis in the most efficient way. So we target our exploration in such a way as to learn faster. So this is the example of uh, some a priori model, uh, sort of some uh, what we call dummy model. So in the beginning, we know that the model three is correct. So in the beginning, our algorithm uh, locked on the model one. Then it tried through epsilon greedy model two. It really didn't like it. So it turned to model one, then kind of jumped forward and backwards. Then it discovered model three, again, epsilon greedy. So we tried new things. Uh, it was not sure uh, whether uh, it is the right model and then it tried the model one again. But then after a while, came to conclusion that the ground truth model three is the correct one. So this is the principle. You look at how the uncertainty evolves at the number of experiments for a relatively small discrete list of models. You use epsilon greedy to try different models, but eventually you uh, lock onto the one that has the best predictive capability. 
that's essentially exactly the same way as how we work as experimentalists when we try to explore. So can we work in, in real life? The answer is, well, if you want to make something like this work, you really need to have a experience in the domain area. And uh, since uh, my primary domain expertise is actually ferroelectric materials, uh, we started with the model of the ferroelectric domain growth under the scanning probe microscopy team. So in this case, if it's our electrodes, we apply bias and we create the domain. There are several limiting cases. So the size of the domain can be limited by the thermodynamics. This case is not determined by, it's not dependent on time, determined only by the voltage applied to the And uh, actually there are two thermodynamic models depending on how broad is the domain. Uh, another opportunity is that the domain size can be determined by uh, the pinning, meaning how fast the domain wall can move in the material in the presence of the electric field. And the th uh, fourth possibility is that uh, our domain wall propagation can be limited by the charge injection on the surface. So we need to provide screening charges for ferroelectric polarization switch, and this uh, charge injection can be the limit. So once we have it, we have four hypotheses. Uh, we know the functional form for this hypothesis. And then we can tell our microscope to actually perform the automated experiment. When the microscope uh, writes the ferroelectric domain, determines the domain size, and uh, based on the measurement of the domain size, it communicates the uh, information to the algorithm. Algorithm tries to find the next location. Uh, in the parameter space, so applies the bias of the different magnitude and different voltage, and uh, takes the image again. So you see this process of the microscope uh, running an image all over again. So it will determine what is the domain size. So you see this is a new domain that has been formed. And then it will uh, continue the process at infinity. So in this case, the microscope is essentially configured as the physics discovery lab which knows how to perform the domain writing experiments and analyze the results real time. So this is how it looks like, uh, sorry, this is how it looks like when the results are combined. So this is our parameter space, the time of the pulse and the magnitude of the pulse. This is how you see we explore this stage. So first we want to do a warm up, and then we start to figure out what is the right model. So we try to find out experimentally what is the physical model process? Sorry, what is the right model that describes our physical process of the domain growth? You can see that after a while, it turns out that model three is the correct model. So the domain growth in this case is limited by the pinning in random media. It is not particularly surprising in this case because for this particular material, uh, it is expected answer, uh, but expected doesn't mean no. So we just verify that our automated experiment give us results that is perfectly plausible. But to the best of my knowledge, this is the first example of fully autonomous physical physics discovery system for automated experiments. So as I said, microscopy is all you need. So now just to finalize the talk, uh, let me just illustrate a few general challenges. First of all, a lot of people uh, argue that, oh, if we have machine learning running the microscopes, our physical experiment, uh, there would be no place for scientists in this brave new world. That's absolutely not true because uh, the most important thing about the automated experiment is the, re the prior knowledge. So what is that we know before the experiment and the reward function. Why are we taking the experiment? Uh, these are parameters which are external for machine learning algorithms. So we need to communicate. Uh, the second thing is that uh, algorithms are great at making fast, low-level decisions. Humans are typically much better at high-level decisions, but humans are much slower. So the expectation can be that uh, this will go hand in hand. Second thing which is really important is that uh, when we talk about the scientific uh, discovery process, we actually have two parts. One part is analyzing the data. But the second part is based on what we know, we formulate the new theories about where we want to go. We cannot make all the experiments. It's a very inefficient strategy. So typically, if we want to run the experiments effectively, we need to formulate a small number of potential possible. 
we want to refine something, we want to explore some opportunity, we want to do the A-B testing, whatever. So it turns out that machine learning is actually great uh, when it comes to uh, refining. So given our prior knowledge and the data, this is how we can uh, uh, shrink down our posterior. So this is the Bayesian approach, uh, given the data, uh, how much can we narrow down this? So this part, I'm convinced is formalizing. This is what machine learning and automated experiments can do. The second part to it, how do we form the hypothesis? So if uh, this is what we know, and these are the directions that we pursue, if we want to get into the unknown, then how do we choose this direction? I don't think that this part is done, and uh, I don't think that, uh, at least for the time being, I have not seen the uh, machine learning papers that talk about. It. There is a lot of work done by people who speculate about the discovery agents, but I have not seen the consistent mathematical framework that actually postulates. And uh, I would argue that humans are going to be good in hypothesis formation for a long, long time. Uh, how it can be done? I mean, maybe it can be done by the rapid hypothesis generation and causing the constraints. I don't expect it to be particularly fruitful, but it may work in the simple ways. Maybe it can be done based on the prior knowledge of data mining, but I think that would be really exciting. That's the area where domain areas and machine learning areas will, can come together. So uh, third thing is that, okay, I've shown the hopefully useful examples of the deep learning. What if I want to do it by myself? So a lot of things that we've done uh, are sitting on uh, Pycroscopy and Maxim's uh, GitHub, including GPIM and JPEG. So if this is something that you're interested in, then you're welcome to explore these repositories and uh, read the, the uh, our YouTube channel and the media. And finally, let's stay in, let's stay in touch. So uh, from my perspective, Twitter is the ideal way of doing it, and I kind of owe Twitter this invitation. And uh, we can also stay in touch by email. Thank you. Okay, Sergey, thank you so much for that fascinating talk. It was really interesting. Um, I wondered what you meant by microscopy is all you need, and I see it much better now. It really is a fantastic tool to probe ground state as we go. Um, I've got a bunch of questions, but let's start with the Q&A from people that attended, the attendees. So if we go to the q and I can read them. I think you should also be able to see them as well. But William Ratcliffe asks, says, any thoughts on the data science education in physical sciences? What would we have to remove, for example, to, to say a physics curriculum to make room for learning data science and AI? Great question. So it's a very complicated question. And uh, to be honest, I don't know that. So uh, my feeling is that the data science uh, needs to be learned in parallel with the physical sciences because the basic way of thinking and formulation is totally different. So uh, when I started to work on the data scientists, the part of uh, Oak Ridge Inst Imaging Institute in 2014, 2015, uh, I used to show a slide which basically said that if you want to do uh, machine learning in physics, you need to forget physics for a year and focus on the machine learning. There is no way around it. Uh, I went through this pathway uh, my colleagues went through exactly the same pathway. Uh, now it is easier than it was then, because now you can go to a place like Pax Publishing and go through uh, Rashka book or through the uh, Psychic Learn book. And, uh, but without learning it, there is nothing you can do about it. Whether you would be, after that, whether you would be able to combine physics and uh, data science for your specific domain, it uh, that's become a creative work, but uh, you don't get to do it unless you paid your dues. And uh, uh, the only way I see is to complement physics science education by the data science education coding. There's no easy way around. You know, when I like that you say you have to learn them in parallel, I almost think that as you were describing it, you almost need to spend less time showing how to solve the nitty gritty details because computation, we know it can do that and more time focusing on like, what are the general trends and the types of things and the types of equations that could describe it, right? Especially if you're doing hypothesis sort of searching. Um, anyways. You need to both in some sense. So for example, when uh, I decided, started to do machine learning seriously, I started with the EDX courses of Udemy 
And I realize in my case, it's absolutely useless because uh, people who teach these courses try to balance their concepts and uh, uh, coding tools. The thing is that I knew concepts on the much higher levels as the result of my education by, back in Russia. So the linear pro kind of, we had quite an extensive course of math. So in my cases, all I needed was to learn coding. For, however, for people who have a different background, it looks different. You just need to learn the way of thinking and not, and the uh, tools and thinking come hand in hand, right? So if you know mathematics very well, but you don't know coding, you can understand things like PC. That's kind of uh, possible. There is no way in the world you can develop an intuition for working with the variation loud encoders unless you spend a year playing with the variation loud encoders applied to different systems. The mathematical intuition develops as the result of doing things. It's like human brain developed partially because uh, several, so many millions of years ago, we started to use six stones. So for physical intuition, coding is the same thing as stick and stone for the, the monkey brain two million years ago. If you don't do it, you cannot understand the concept. So you don't need to do it on the level of making the production quality code or uh, have your GitHub repository, but without hands-on experience, you just don't get to do that. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Ramsey Issa. So this is a fantastic application of informatics. I'm currently running an active learning model as well. I was just curious how many iterations of the active learning cycle did you have to run to get a model that sufficiently prediction action? So I guess we saw that it kind of depended on the application, right? Uh, it depends on how constrained your priors are. So it depends on the dimensionality of the parameter space. It depends on the variability. Uh, so in some sense, all the applications that we worked on were uh, built in cognizance on the fact that the experimental uh, budgets are often much more limited than uh, is the case for theory and often much more limited than is the case for the large scale application. So if I run the experiment of the material discovery on two or three dimensional phase diagram, uh, I really want to discover if I make films, which has to be done sequentially, I really want to do it in 50, 20 steps for the three dimensional phase diagram. That's a tall order. So if I uh, run the automated experiment on the microscope, realistically I have space for thousands of measurements, but not 10,000, not 100,000, because then how my probe would be great. And uh, this is the reason why I kind of had to develop the lean and the physics heavy algorithms. This is also the reason to, uh, uh, this is also the answer to uh, Bill's question about the SGP compared to the reinforcement learning. So the pure data driven, I mean, first of all, uh, GP, Bayesian optimization and reinforcement learning are not that difficult, different on some level. So the GP uses policies. Uh, if you try to use Gaussian process to bootstrap itself, then you have to introduce the policy. Not normally done, but uh, kind of high level of GP have this option. But simple reinforcement learning is purely data intensive. So a year ago, I spent uh, another summer trying to train the uh, actor critic algorithm to play Mario. Uh, and I realized that 95% of the time, Mario learns that Goombas are not your friend. So purely data-driven strategies are exceptionally, uh, are exceptionally efficient. And for most experiments, they're simply not going to work. So what can be efficient if our policies, uh, if our reinforcement, if we have a model-based reinforcement learning, the model is physical and we update it during the experiment. So we haven't done that because conceptually uh, SGP is easier, but uh, I would add the physics discovery as a part of RL if I were to make it uh, practically useful. Um, how about this one from Michael Alverson? Uh, with the deep learning, he's talking about embedding sizes. He's asking were there different embedding sizes considered and did that play a role basically in improving it or not? Uh, you mean the dimensionality, right? I assume that's what he means, yeah. Uh, so um, this is a very interesting question, which is actually very fundamental. What is the dimensionality of your data if you use the nonlinear embedding? Uh, it's not a fixed answer because I can tune the essentially variation allowed and order in such ways to blow up the differences or find the similarities. But there is an optimum. 
So I can say that if I tune the, let's say, KL term, there would be a large spectrum of the KL term where the embedding has a specific relatively small dimensionality. So in physics problem associated with the imaging, when our variability of the input data is relatively small, we get surprisingly good results with the two-dimensional lack of space. So the reason why we'll run like two dimensions is because it's, first of all, it's easy to visualize. Secondly, if you look at the latent manifold in 2D, you can instantly say whether it is optimal dimension or you clearly try to squeeze a three-dimensional object in the two-dimensional space. They behave <coughs> sorry, very differently in this case. And the uh, third thing is that, uh, uh, as I said, most of the algorithms that we use are light and we want them deployed as a part of the edge computer, meaning it has to work on the same time scale as the microscope. So uh, electron microscope generates data uh, 10 frames per second. Any probe microscope is smaller, but for any of you who work with the GP, being able to update your every second is not a trivial thing. GP is actually slow. Interestingly, uh, structure and the deep kernel learning are much faster, so it works. And we don't even need the uh, uh, DJ Xbox next to the microscope, but this is staying on the lower. First, personally, I would be very interested to see how this concept can be extended for the chemical discovery, where the embeddings have to be a larger dimension. So this would be a great area to explore uh, together. Uh, one argument that I want to make, and this is a speculation, but I think it's very easy to prove, is that imagine that you have a situation when you have all data, the static data set, and you try to use the, let's say, variational out encoder to find the optimal embedding. So if you played with this experiment, uh, it's very common to see that uh, points that are supposed to be close to each other actually form in the split manifolds in the latter case, especially if we try to squeeze them in the too low a dimension. So one argument that I pose that if we run the active learning experiment, whether rather than dumping everything, we sort of navigate the process to build embedding adaptively, they would be much smoother and uh, better suited for the Bayesian optimization process. I can optimize based on the smooth manifold. I really cannot optimize if one part of my manifold is one part of the space, another part of the different part of the space. Uh, I can kind of illustrated using the toy example like cars data set. Uh, but if the principle holds more complex system, then that may be a direction to person. Um, I like the question from Nicole. It says, in some fields that relied on statistical techniques really heavily, so social psycholo psychology or others, uh, there were things that were sort of considered foundational that were only later revealed to be statistical artifacts, right? Once they got bigger data sets or better techniques, do you think that there are lessons for us in this uh, in material science, salt state chemistry, condensed matter? How do we avoid these statistical traps? Um, maybe one example from what you showed, for example, you showed how great the greedy algorithm worked at finding these, you know, grain boundaries or whatever, but is that gonna introduce a bias where we're missing the interesting things that are biased away from that? So yeah, what, what do you have to say about that one? Absolutely, no, I fully agree with it. First of all, uh, I mean, all of us know multiple examples of the previous theories and explanations being correct. Uh, getting out of this trap is very difficult because in the hint side, they're obvious. Obviously, uh, they're traps because we couldn't foresee them. Uh, I think we can make the process of getting out of the traps less painful. Uh, and this is kind of the culture of open data, open code, and uh, exchange of ideas. So if I know that, uh, just a simple example, if I know that my scientific career for the next uh, 20 years is not going to be derailed by my previous paper being wrong, I obviously would be much more open for people saying that this paper is correct. If I publish my data and I know that uh, the way this data is used is not going to affect my, uh, I mean, you know, there's quite a lot of fields tend to start with consider, considering the data to be the crown jewels, so they're inclined to share it because the assumption is that I spend a year collecting it, I don't want anybody else to analyze it and generate the credit. So that's a cultural problem. So if we get over this problem, the process will become smoother, but it will never become easier. 
Um, maybe one last question if you've got the time, Sergey. Uh, this comes from Trupti Mohanty. She's asking, what's the best approach for selecting kernel functions? I and mean, you saw, for example, structured GP versus mm -hmm. not, how important that paying attention to short versus long range or both or neither, right, should be. So you see, the funny thing is that uh, there is the whole uh, textbook. I think the last one is the that I read was the guy from Louis, uh, I think, Ruben, about the Bayesian optimization. So he made it uh, open and really fantastic book. But the thing is that uh, I don't think that if we want to apply Gaussian processes in physics, uh, the kernel function is that important. So in many cases, a uh, kernel function is important when we have some structure of correlation. So for example, if I want to use the Gaussian process to operate atomically resolved microscope, it would be natural for me to introduce the uh, periodic uh, spec spread spectrum kernel. Practically, I probably, because uh, the spread spectrum kernel basically reflects the presence of the Fourier periodicity system. Practically, I probably will not going to do that because uh, I know how long it will take on the computational side. But at least theoretically, in this case, the kernel matches the physics of my system. Uh, in most problems that people are familiar with or people have to deal with, to my knowledge, it is far more important to introduce the prior knowledge, whether you use a deep kernel learning or multi-fidelity Gaussian process less important, they kind of have quite significant similarity, or it is important to introduce the uh, mean function because it reflects the physics of the process. And the great thing about the physics is the universality classes and laws, and this is what is natural application. Most of the time, you can get very far with the kernel function being the RBM, essentially saying, I don't know anything about the correlation of the system, except that I speculate that they have a certain length. So that's it. So for example, if I use the deep kernel learning, I don't know anything about the physics of the latent state. So there is some work when people try to work on interventions for the latent variables, but not to my knowledge in the detail. So the only thing that I can learn about the latent space is the correlations. The correlation of the latent space would be actually determined by the noise level in our input data because it kind of determines on which uh, scale the uh, latent points are mixed with each other. So there is a lot of work done in that area. I don't think that uh, for physical systems, this is the most high priority direction except for some special cases. Well, fantastic. Sergey, thank you again. We wish we were in person. We could take you out to dinner and chat and a lot more about this, but we sure appreciate you coming and joining this webinar. Um, if folks enjoyed this, we plan on having one basically once a month. So one in September, October, November, at least. Um, and if you were interested in participating in the hackathon, I hope that you'll look it up and submit something. Otherwise, Sergey, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you for inviting. It was a great, great talk. Okay. See you, everybody. Thanks.